I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone for joining us tonight. In honor of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, local veteran Wade Confer will be sharing his experiences with us tonight. Mr. Confer is a veteran of the United States Army Paratrooper Artillery Division. Um, he was drafted in January 1957. While serving our nation, he was stationed in Germany. Mr. Confer has also been very active in missionary work with the group Vacations with a Purpose um, since the year 2000. This has enabled him to return to Germany many times to assist its citizens and learn more about the country's history. During his time in Germany, he even lived with German families and made several trips to the Nazi concentration camps where he learned more about the atrocities perpetrated upon the Jewish people. Confer heard many first-hand accounts of life in Germany during World War II from people who witnessed Nazi Germany brutality. Tonight's program is intended for mature audiences as some of the information that Mr. Confer will share could be disturbing to some. So at this point, I would like to welcome Mr. Confer. Welcome to you that are in here in person and those that are watching on Facebook. Uh, I just wondered if any of you might be of Jewish extraction or of German extraction because some of these things that I have to say might be uh, not so well received by you, but nevertheless, they were what I observed. In 1957, I was stationed in Augsburg, Germany, which was near Munich, which was also close to Dachau, the first concentration camp. Now, to understand what concentration camps are, we have to know what the Holocaust was. The Holocaust, if you look it up in the dictionary, it has to do with conflagration, which means to be burned completely. And that's what, sad to say, the Nazi Germans did to many of the people, not only the Jews, but to communists, people that were crippled, people, people that had two different colored eyes, everything that they could find that disagreed with the German people, they put them in prison camps and experimented, sad to say, sometimes medically on them. And that was not too nice a thing for them people to do. But to understand Germany is the fact that after the, how Hitler came into power, after the First World War, the Allies, the British, the Americans, and the French, they didn't treat Germany very well. It was nothing like after the Second World War, where the Americans had what was called the Marshall Plan, and we helped them out a lot. And that's the way it's been ever since then. Even though the war ended in 1945, we have still been helping them out, and at one time, uh, Germany, at the end of the Second World War, was divided into two camps. The Russians were on one side, in which Berlin, the capital, was, was, and the other side was divided by the French, the American, and the English. But to get back to how Hitler came into power is the fact that he had what we would call the good media core. He had people that after, in 1933, he started a, an uprising with the German people, what was called the brown shirts, that spread uh, false rumors about what was going on. And, and the Germans were having a very tough time, but he made them very nationalistic and he wanted them to be known as the great Aryan country, the country of white supremacists. But as Hitler grew into power, he assigned what we would call in this country a cabinet, people like Gary, Himmler, Ehrlichman, and so on, that 
helped him carry out his orders. And under the military rule that he set up, the what was called the SS, the stormtroopers, they came into power, who part of which eventually became what we now know as the Gestapo. Now, before I go much further, one of the worst places that I ever was when I was in Germany at any time was visiting Gestapo headquarters. And it was a place where the Gestapo kept their prisoners and interrogated them, and they put them in little cages that were about the size of what would keep maybe a German Shepherd dog, and that was the place that they kept them before they interrogated them and made up their mind what they were going to do with them. But as Hitler uh, came into power because of the weakness of Bismarck, who had preceded him, that the German army began to expand greatly, and with that, it started to invade countries around them. Uh, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, France, Poland, and even partially into Russia. But they only got as far as Stalingrad in Russia because, uh, it's funny to say, the winter that they had in Stalingrad was like we're having here now. It was very cold and very snowy, and that's not stopped the German army, and the Russians were able to take over and drive them back. Now, when I was in the army, like I said, I was stationed uh, with the 319th Field Artillery Battalion, which is the artillery end of the uh, American Army of the Infantry. and. So I had the opportunity since my wife joined us there in Germany that we were able to visit Dachau. Now Dachau is close to Munich, like it said. And the thing is, Dachau was the first of the concentration camps. Now the way the concentration camps worked was they took people that descended against Hitler. And then they took the gypsies, the communists, the people that were physically or mentally disabled, and anybody else that they found fault with. And they put them in these concentration camps. Now, when the Germans would move through the towns within Germany, and the foreign lands that they they uh, captured, they had what was called the Einsatzgruppen. Now that would be like saying they were invading Bradford in McKean County. The Einsatzgruppen would go from Bradford to Smithport to Kane to Port Allegheny and so on, and they would kill all the Jews that they could find before the armies took over. Now, they either hung them or shot them, and they shot them in the head usually, but they buried them in graves that they had themselves had dug. Now, Hitler in, ended up having 63 concentration camps. Now, a concentration camp, each individual one had sub-camps, that would be like FCI McKean, having a jail in Bradford, one in Smithport, one in Kane, one in Port Allegheny. They had hundreds of them. Now, of the 63 concentration camps, there were six that were called extermination camps, and by that they meant the six places where the people were either starved to death, which was a large share of, and remember they killed between eight and ten million people in this uh, way of doing it, and they took them to what was called a shower, 
which was actually a place to gas them. Now, when they first did this, they tried to use the generator exhaust or the exhaust from their trucks, which used diesel fuel. That wasn't ki killing the people in these ovens or the place showers. They weren't killing them fast enough, so they started using a poison called Zyklon B, and that was settled it. And it they would take the people into the showers, telling them that they were just going to take showers, and then they would turn open the vents that turned on the Zyklon B. That was the way that they got them. And then when they were done, they would open the doors, and the people that would open the doors were also people that were in the concentration camp that were prisoners, but they had special privileges. They would go in and they would drag out the bodies, put them in wheelbarrows and trucks, and take them to the ovens where they would put them on the griddle, so to speak, on uh, platforms, and they would burn them to death, what was left, and some of them were still alive. Now, when they were done with them, they would have these same people that were also prisoners go in and remove them from the ovens and take them to ditches that the prisoners had dug themselves and they would bury them there and make them shovel dirt back on top of them. They, did. they had them dig ditches and probably five to six feet deep and they would fill them partially with firewood and put diesel fuel on them. Then the people that had survived would be put into those things and they would light them on fire and burn them to death. Then they would take bulldozers and bulldoze the dirt over that hadn't been pushed back in by people with shovels. The shovels, of course, were used by the prisoners, but most of them were too weak to do much. In each one of the barracks, which were made to house probably 80 to 100 people, they would put somewhere between 800 and 1,000 people, prisoners. They would sleep crosswise and on top of each other, and that's the way they did. At 3.30 in the morning, they would have them fall out for what the military in the United States calls formation, and the SS, the stormtroopers, they would walk up and down the formations and they would pick out the ones that were to be put into the gas chambers in the ovens for that day. Now, during the night, they had to have so many people. Let's say the barracks had 800. When they would fall out for the formation, they had to have 800 people that they had the night before. But let's say 20 or 30 of them had died, they were passed away. What they did to make the quantity that was required for the SS, the prisoners that were still alive and in fairly good shape would drag the dead prisoners out and hold them between them so that they could be counted. Because if they didn't have the 800, they had to do extra duty. In fact, they might be the ones that were chosen to go to the crematorium for that day. Now, I was had the opportunity while I was in the military, as I said, to be stationed near Munich and was able to go and visit Dachau. After I left Germany. And, oh, by the way, while I was there in Germany, I lived with German families. And the, lot, the German families that I lived with had lived also with Hitler's regime and during his time. And they were very adamant about denying that they knew anything that happened when you could smell the burning flesh, which was just miles away from them where the ovens were burning the 
Jewish and gypsies and the bodies of the people that Hitler didn't like. But when they decided to expand into uh, Russia, they made a uh, concentration camp in Ossheim, Poland, which the Germans named Auschwitz, and it became known as the greatest of all prisons. And by that I meant the number of people that were killed there was probably somewhere around 8 million people. Now, can you imagine hating a people enough that you would want to eliminate them just because they were Irish or Italians or Polish or whatever, but here Hitler hated the Jews enough and it's not really known whether he may have been part Jew himself through his mother's line. But nevertheless, the German people were incited by Hitler and the propaganda to hate the Jews. Now, I feel from what I've read, the fact that the Jews were very, as a group of people, well off. They owned the banks, they owned businesses, and they own manufacturing companies, and so the, that made the rest of the Germans very easy to convince by Hitler and his people, Himmler and Hess, the propagandists, that the Jews were the ones to blame for all their problems. Now, just to stop for a minute, I want you to think about what's going on in this country today how we're blaming the blacks for all the problem, or all somebody else, and hopefully we're not headed down that road. But nevertheless, during these extermination camps of Auschwitz, now, for those of you that are here, I have six books that I've accumulated that you'll see here on the table to my right that have to do with the Holocaust. Now, the first book is strictly about the Holocaust and the, how it came about. The second book is a book that I bought when I was at Sachsenhausen, which is the concentration camp that is closest to Berlin. And at one time I've heard that it was a prison for women but mostly men. As the Russians advanced from Russia after being invaded by Hitler, they overran or freed the people in Auschwitz. And what they did is they took the prisons and either by truck or marched them to a country inside of, uh, to another country, usually inside of Germany or Hungary, and that's when I had a chance to visit Buchenwald, which is near Weimar, Germany, which is just inside the Polish-German border. Now the thing that, two things that I noticed about Buchenwald when I visited there. The trains would come in like they did to all the prison camps, but they would they couldn't come in to Buchenwald because it was up on a mountain. And they would make the prisoners dig a road from Weimar up onto this mountain. It'd be like going up to Rue to the concentration camp. And then they would do them in there. The other thing that I noticed about Buchenwald is it had these great mounds of dirt that looked to be probably six feet high and maybe 10 or 12 feet wide, but they were hundreds of yards long. And the thing that I found out was that when Auschwitz was freed and they took the prisoners to Buchenwald, 
Buchenwald couldn't handle them. So what they did, they had them dig these ditches without the firewood in them, had them get down in the ditches and buried them, most of them alive, with bulldozers. Now, I thought that that was the worst place that I'd ever been, but like I told you, I had the chance to go to the Holocaust Museum in Berlin, but while I was there, they took us to see the place that the Gestapo interrogated their prisoners, and that really got to me. That you could treat another human being like an animal, like a dog. And that's where they kept him before they interrogated him. And of course, you know, the interrogation was never very kind. Uh, the way that I got to be, after I was discharged from the service and left Germany and came back to the States, I joined a group called Vacation with a Purpose. And the reason for that was we went all over the eastern and southern United States helping rebuild after fires, floods, tornadoes, hurricanes. And I found out that a group from uh, the United Methodist Church called UMCOR, which is United Methodist Overseas Relief Organization, was going back to Germany. When I was in Germany, the Russians had a wall around Berlin in 1961, but I, I was there 57, 58, 59, but they had a fence around all of East Germany, and every time that the Russians would, as the American newspaper would say, would saddle their, uh, rattle their swords, since I was in the airborne, which is always prepared to go to where any trouble is in the world. If you've seen in the news lately, the 101st and the 82nd Airborne, they're the first ones to move out. So when I was there in 57 and 58, when the Russians would come up to their side of the fence that they had put up, <laughs> They, we would move out to the field and we would stand on the other side of the fence with our military equipment and then after three days or four weeks why the Russians would retreat and then we would go back to our barracks. So, but I wanted to go back to see what Germany was like in 2001. I happened to be in Germany on September 11, 2001, helping rebuild a former German youth camp. It's now owned by the Methodist Church of Germany. And we were there when they, Twin Towers were struck. I don't want to go into any religion, but when the Twin Towers were struck, and they tried to, well, they hit the Pentagon and they tried to hit the White House, but they stopped them in Pittsburgh. I was in Germany with our group helping rebuild this camp, and we were scheduled to come back on that Tuesday. But, of course, they grounded everybody. And as strange as it may seem, the Germans that we were living with at this it was like a college campus that belonged to the United Methodist Church and they used it for campers throughout the year, that they wouldn't allow us Americans to go downtown to any place in Germany. It was East Germany, but it was free at the time. And they wouldn't allow us to go down unless 10 or 12 of them went with us, you know. <laughs> They were, they were afraid that we would be taken hostage by Muslims. There's still a lot of Muslims in Germany. 
or even the Russians. And uh, so we were uh, delayed a week and came back on the following Tuesday. I want to say one thing about having the opportunity to visit Germany and while I was in Germany, I was sent down to Beirut, Lebanon, when they had their first civil war to try to settle them there. But I've been to Beirut, Lebanon, and I've been to South Africa, I've been to Australia, I've been to Canada, Newfoundland, I've been every place but to Mexico, and so, I don't have to. Uh, but as far as the concentration camps were concerned, as the armies advanced, both the American and French and English and the Russians from the East, they liberated these camps, these concentration camps. And as you can see, if you could have seen some of the uh, pictures that were shown of what it looked like in the concentration camp, a person, let's say a man, would go in weighing 200 pounds. Inside of four years, he might weigh 90 pounds. And the reason for that, they starved him to death. They fed him food that was mixed with sawdust or sand. That was their daily meal until they pass away. One other thing, while I was reading the book about Auschwitz that I have, which is the worst of all the books, if you want to call it the detail of how they treated the prisoners, that sometimes when they weren't dying fast enough, Dr. Mengele would take a hypodermic needle and take formaldehyde and insert it into their hearts so that they would die faster. Then he would take them down to the uh, autopsy room, which one of these doctors wrote one of these books that I have. He was a Jew, but he was Mengele's right-hand man. And he was watched over by Mengele. Mengele would send him down to the autopsy room and with a body and have him cut his scalp open and examine his brain and the people that had one eye and one brown eye, those were the type of people. Dwarfs would be chosen to. Gypsies, uh, people that were uh, having mentally, mental problems, they would also be taken to, from the oven to the autopsy room and the doctor would perform autopsies on them like American doctors do their unknown death. I don't know how else to explain, but can you imagine? Then this other book that I got here from this library is that photographer that took the pictures of the prisoners as they came in so they would know who they had on hand. The Germans were very meticulous about keeping records and that included films and that's where some of these films came from that we're seeing here. The Germans took them. But the thing is, they would take their pictures when they were alive and when the autopsies would be performed, and I hate to hurt anybody's feelings, but when they were performing the autop autopsies on these bodies, they would also take pictures of them. So Mengele could see what made people have one eye brown and one eye blue or what made them act up because they had a mental problem or what caused dwarfism. Anything as you probably know from American history and what you've seen in documentaries on TV. Concentration camps and Dr. Mengele and his experiments and the doctors that helped him were not very kind, not very emo 
not very moral. Now, if anybody has any questions about what went on and what was said about what went on, I'm open to any questions that anybody might have. The gas that you mentioned that they used in the chambers, uh, how did that work? Did, was that a gas that um, uh, dispelled the oxygen intake so people suffocated? Or? Yes. It was called prussic acid, which ended up being called Cyclone B. And they would lay it on like shelves around the outside, vents, and then they would suck the air from the prussic acid, the Cyclone B, into the gas chambers. One thing that I will say about the gas chambers, in people that are trying to escape, let's say the ceiling was 20 feet high. The Zyklon B would come in through the vents that were close to the floor. And the people in trying to escape would climb up on each other's body until they reached the ceiling where they could not go any further and died there. So sometimes when the other prisoners that were special in the barracks that had the job of going to the ovens and take uh, to the gas chamber and take them out and take them to the ovens, they would find them stacked up like that and they had to take some of them apart that were their friends and their family. And as I said before, the concentration camps had these wire fences, of course, electrified around them and guard houses and the trains would come in and the cars that were made for 80 or 100 people and might have 800 to 1,000 of them in. And then they would make them get out and leave their baggage inside the car, their big baggage, their hand baggage they could take with them. Then they would get out and they would make them line up in two lines, a left line and a right line. Women in the left with their children, men on the right. And then they would take and if some of the SS, particular Himmler, or some of his henchmen, would walk up and down the line, particularly the women, and if they found women that looked like they could work, they would pull them out. But the rest of the women and children immediately went to the gas chambers, and then the others. But the men, if they were feeble, they might go to the gas chambers too, but generally the men were the, who were kept in the barracks. Like I said, the barracks were made to hold a hundred and they might have a thousand people in them. And they would stack them up. And if you've seen them on TV and documentaries, they had like bunk beds and they would lay on top of each other. And then in the morning they would fall out and they'd take the dead with them and that they would starve them to death as well as sending them to the gas chamber. Any other questions? One of the things that happened was the fact that the people that were prisoners did almost all the work. They dug the ditches that, that they burned them in. They put them in the... When they went to the gas chamber, they thought they were going to take showers, and they took their clothes and everything with them, and they would take their clothes off and then go into the gas chamber and they turn the gas on them. They would take the hair and make mattresses out of them, because they would scrape the hair off of these people. They would take the bones and make fertilizer. Uh, there was one other thing that they did, I can't remember what it was, that's they, from the bodies. And of course, they went in and it, when they got out of the, these boxcars, they had handbags. The big bags they left in there. The Germans later on would go into the big bag and take the big bags and sort them out because they had clothes on them and they would send them back 
to Germany or wherever they needed to their own people. And they do the same thing with any jewelry or possessions that a person might want. They would steal, like steal them, take them, and send them back to Germany too. And some of them had Uh, what do they call fingers that uh, if they were stealing jewelry and watches say sometimes it would end up in their pocket <laughs> it was uh, it, it was just one horrible thing and I just hope and the saying goes that it never happens again Auschwitz which was the biggest one and like I said was in Poland and if you've seen the documentaries on that, there's no, nothing that exists there anymore. They bulldozed it all down and it turned it into like a cemetery or just a big lawn. Only the people, and the people that were there that can go back now are 90 and 100 years old. Because I've lived in Bradford almost 80 years, so that tells you something <laughs> how old I am. But if I happened to live in Germany, I probably would have been one of the dissidents against Hitler. Now I have a book here that's by, excuse me, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a minister in Germany, and he was one of those that was part of the group that tried to assassinate Hitler. And of course they caught him. And they took him, they moved him from camp to camp because the Russians or the Americans or the French or the English were getting closer and closer to them. And so as a last resort, they took him down to the concentration camp in Hungary and hung him along with the others that were with him. Uh, I was going to say, did you have a question? Wait, you were in Germany in 57, 58, 59? Bigger part? Were you in Germany in 57? Yes, I was in Germany in 57, 58, and part of 59. So that was 12 plus years after the end of World War II. Yes. Did Germany try to destroy the evidence of all the... Yes. The harm they had done so the world wouldn't know? Yes, and what they didn't destroy or try to hide, they all said that they weren't part of it. And not only weren't they part of it, they said that they didn't know anything about what was going on. Now, the first family that my wife and I lived with when she first came to Germany, the they owned this apartment building. It was like the Emory Towers. And we had a one-room apartment, if you believe that. <laughs> but the husband had been the chief of police in Augsburg during Hitler's reign. Now let's pretend that this room is like their apartment. He could not go to any room in that apartment that had a window to the outside because there were still people that he'd arrested for the Gestapo and he was afraid of being assassinated. And later I'll tell you about his wife. Were you in the army at that time? In 57? Were you in yeah. the army? I was in the army. I didn't have enough rank. You had to be a sergeant or higher, and I had just gone into the army, and I didn't have enough rank to what was called on-base housing. I didn't have enough, so my wife and I had to live with German families. Now, since then, when I've gone back with vacation with a purpose, I've lived with people from the church that we were helping out. And that's how I know 
German son. And by the way, I speak very little German. Now, what German I first learned had to do with military German. Like, how many in your company? Where's your company commander? What kind of weapons do you have? But since I went back, I learned how, where's the train station? Where's the closest restaurant? And where's the toll? <laughs> I can speak some German very little, and I've forgotten most of what I did learn. Anything else? Well, thanks for everybody and for the library for giving me this chance to expound a little bit about concentration camps and my experiences with them.